Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and in this video we're going to continue to rebuild the Koenig race car. It's going to be a little bit of different things because we are in that stage. In the previous episode we actually fixed the cooling system and I'll give you a close-up on how far we are with that. We'll actually uh, put cooling liquid into the engine now We'll change some spark plugs, we'll change the oil filter, we change the oil. You know, very basic maintenance, not really tuning. We also will um, suck out the fuel, put a new fuel filter up, just to make sure I can get it running because we changed all the cabling and it's a slight chance that I screwed up something and that, that I connected the wrong cables. So that might be, so it's always good to check before we do the complete full assembly. And without any further ado, let's have a look on the cooling system, what we have done so far. As you can see, we sorted out the tubings, uh, we got everything nicely strapped down so it can't move. And where did it? I actually used Velcro straps, so I like those better often than tie wraps because they don't cut in that bad and it's easy to remove as well. And on the cooling tube, I have one connection for a gauge straight on the engine, which is a pure mechanical gauge, and here that is. And the gauge is a temperature gauge. So let me try to stick that in there. Here we go. And you can see it's around 22 degrees centigrade already, because that's the room temperature. I also have a second sensor on this tube, which is actually uh, feeding then my digital meter, which is I have on the dashboard. And on the dashboard, we've got our VDO temperature gauge, and that is why I needed to fit an additional sensor in that one tube that I just showed you. And for the cooling, I'm going to use prepared cooling liquid from Bardal. This is pretty good stuff. Um, it also protects the engine, and it's good uh, to about minus 25 degrees and over 105 degrees centigrade. So we should be good with this. So let's see if we can put some cooling liquid in and um, see how it goes. Oh, it is full. All right, so I'm going to close this up. So let's see if we can get it started. So the next thing we're going to install is a battery and this battery is still an acid-based battery which I rather don't fit. I did order a lithium-based battery because that's lighter. It's about the same size so I did check on that but I haven't received it yet. So I'm going to start with this um, acid-based, lead-based battery. And this is actually an 8 amp hour battery, more than good enough for that type of a bike. Because remember, this race car also has a generator inside the engine, so it can charge the battery. It's not like uh, what you've seen on the Hauke, where we have no uh, alternator to uh, charge the battery. So, I'm going to install this on the side. I'm having some of this foam, and it's self-adhesive, that I'm going to stick on the bottom so the battery will sit on it. So it makes it a bit softer, it's not going to rattle or shake. So. I just peel off that protection layer and that goes in. So now I can actually fit the battery. I already did it on the other sides as well, so it's not going to be uh, shaking at all while we drive because that's the last thing you want. We can install the battery now. You can see it's easy, it doesn't rattle at all. And then I will place the bracket around it uh, like so. But I need to bolt it down here uh, at the top. So let's see if I can get it in. All right. That will do it. And I need to find my wrench for it because this is an 8 mil. There we go. 
now I can lock it in place and we are all set. So now the battery is firm. I still need to connect, of course, the cables to it. And uh, I'm not going to do this one right now because I have to do something else first. The part that I have right here uh, is the solenoid for the starter engine. And this used to be connected to the frame with tie wraps. However, it has a rubber support, as you can see. So I've made a small bracket, and here is that bracket. Let me just flip this out here. And here is that metal bracket, or aluminum bracket, which now can hold the uh, solenoid. So I can actually slide this in here, um, but of course, the other direction. And then um, I can have it riveted down to this aluminum panel here. And that way, it's not going to move around. But let me kind of disconnect the the fuel filter because that's something we'll deal with shortly afterwards and it gives me a bit more space to work I will just work. So, that is easy. You just put the rivet through it and then lock it in place. I'm gonna make sure it's in. There we go. Now that is on. Of course, I still need to deal with the cables now. And let me hook up the connector in the back, cover up the fuse. There we go. The next step is to remove this black cable and put a red cable on to the positive side of the battery and then connect this cable going to the starter because this is the starting solenoid. So the cable shoe, I'm going to tin it first and I put a little bit of uh, soldering liquid inside because that helps the flow. And here is the cable and you can see that the little bit of burning we had on the insulation is gone because I have put a heat shrink around it. So this is about ready now to be installed. Let's see if we can get this on like this. So I'm gonna use some of those sticky attachments and if you degrease the aluminum with acetone beforehand, they stick pretty well. That should be about it. Yep. This is the end result. It was a little bit of work to make all these cables, but at the end it turned out to be not that hard. So I think now I have a pretty good setup. Cables are pretty good solid in place because you don't want to touch the positive cable, the chassis, uh, anywhere. So um, that's why I don't like to have it rubbing against anything. And let me show you where we have the start relay, what we've done there. And even that one, I think, looks quite all right. So here is the start relay, and we have the connectors locked down. Um, you can see the heat shrink, so it cannot make no shorts. And then I reused this old cap uh, that can go on it. And that will really um, shield it off well. So there we go. 
I'm not going to do a maintenance on the engine itself, but here is the fuel filter. And since I'm going to drain the old fuel out of the old fuel tank, because that fuel can be very old, I'm just going to remove the filter and already kind of disconnected it. And then afterwards, we go in to install a brand new filter, uh, like so. And the other hose is sitting right here. This is the other hose. Uh, so this is going to go in like this. Um, but I'm going to use this hose here to suck out the old fuel. I don't think there's a lot in it, but still, I want to get it all out. And to do this, I'm going to use this mega syringe. Well, I'm actually kidding. This is the kind of stuff you use to put add blue to your car, but it's great because I can actually suck up all that old fuel out of the tank without having to remove the tank, at least. So let me hook it up. So let's uh, connect it up to the hose coming from the tank. And let's see what we can suck out. Well, there's not a lot coming out of it. There's a little bit, as you can see, but not a lot. So it's as good as empty. Oop. So now I can put a new fuel filter up and we should be all set for that part. So this is the new fuel filter and typically they come with two sizes of uh, plastic tubes, so depending on, on what you need. And you can cut off a piece, the, uh, the thin piece in the front, you can actually cut off if you don't need it. And that's what I've done on this side. Now, don't use a hacksaw, just use some Stanley knife and do a clean cut because you don't want these particles uh, inside your fuel system. So uh, keep in mind as well that there is a direction on them, so fuel should flow this way because there's an arrow there. So let me put that up. But before doing so, I need to put some clamps up so I don't get any leaks. Yeah, that's in. And then we also do the other side here. Put the clamp in and then we should be all set to go with this. So let me tighten this up and we should be all right. I think this is tight and We'll see, I'll do a double check uh, once the engine is running to see if we have no leaks, so if we are not sucking any air. So the battery is complete, everything else is wired up, so let's see um, if things work or not. That seems to be okay. Now let's see if we can give it like a quick punch to see if it starts, but it's not going to run because I have no cooling liquid on it, just to see. That doesn't seem to work. That one does, so we should be good. So let's see if the rain light is working. I'm not going to tune the engine right now, but I'm still going to change the spark plugs. Uh, we're going to change the filter, uh, the oil filter, with a high flow oil filter. And then we put some oil in it. And then uh, we also will fill it up with some cooling liquid. And hopefully we can start it up. And then we'll do all the tuning on the carburetors later in a special video. But this at least will allow me to get it started and making sure that all the electronics are working as they should because we took a lot of things apart. The spark plugs. I guess you all have replaced power plugs before in your life, so not much to it. I'm just going to disconnect the ignition coils um, because on this spike they are on top of the spark plugs. And then you can pull them out. See, these are the ignition coils. And I always keep them in order. This is number one. Uh, this is number two. And let me take them all four out. And before taking the spark plugs out, I like to blow it clean. So let's see if we can get them out in one piece. Oh, that's not too bad. Now those are quite deep in there and I don't have a, a socket with a rubber inside. So for me to pull them out with the socket, um, it's almost impossible. Let's do this. Now, I will need to use my magnet to put it out. And here's a spark plug. And you can see that these are having two electrodes. 
uh, versus most cars only have one electrode. On a bike, often you see two electrodes or even three. And it's always good if you have your new spark plug to compare it, especially the length of the shaft, that is the same. But even the name is the same, or the number CR9EK, CR9EK. So this is exactly the same spark plug. So I'm gonna oil the thread a little bit, just a little bit. I know some people say you don't need to do that, but I still like to do that. I'm a bit old school. And again, I will load it in with my magnet. There we go. And then try to grab it and feel if it seats properly. I think it does. You don't want to false thread. These are the spark plugs that came out of the car. And as you can see, there is one that sticks out. Uh, not only does it have only one pin, the others all have two pins, but also the thread is a lot shorter. There's another piece. So this is a complete different type of spark plug that has gone in. And it's a CR9EH9, completely different than the others. So it's amazing what people do sometimes. And, and, and then they are surprised that engines don't run well. And I don't know. I mean, the guy who owned this car before, who raced with it, he must have been on a real tight budget. So I've drained the oil and that was a bit of a mess, but okay, it's out. So now we're going to fill it up. There is an hourglass here so I can see uh, how much oil I need to put in. And it, there's a label there, completely dry, 3.8. So I think that's what it needs, 3.8 liters. So let's fill it up. That is it. I've been able to fill up the cooling liquid of the car. However, I came to the conclusion that this setup here is actually having a design flaw, which we need to correct. And if you allow me, I would like to explain what the issue was. Um, I couldn't get all the air out of the cooling system. So in other words, the amount of cooling liquid that I was trying to get into the engine wasn't enough according to the specs. So I had to revert back to another solution, which is a vacuum method. And this is the vacuum system that I used uh, to get all the air pockets out of the cooling system and fill it up with cooling liquid. Uh, in essence, uh, you connect this blue hose to your radiator cap with a special adapter, and here is that adapter. And then you connect your compressor to one side and you let it blow through, you open up the valves here, and because of the Venturi effect, you're gonna suck vacuum inside your um, system and then you'll see how much vacuum you're actually sucking and then when the vacuum stays steady then you close the valve here and then you open up the valve which is actually going to your uh, reservoir of your cooling liquid that you just bought and that you want to get into the car and that fills it up really nice so if you want to see on how that is done then i would recommend that you look at one of my other videos now we have another problem and that relates to the position of the radiator towards the engine. The engine in this case is much higher up than the radiator. Now on the normal Ninja, the radiator is above the engine and therefore any eventual air bubbles will actually travel along the system and end up in the radiator. Now in this case, the radiator being very much lower, that ain't gonna happen. So I'm gonna have potentially a lot of air bubbles inside the cooling jacket of the engine. And this is something you really don't want to have. You don't want to have those hot spots. Now, of course, with the vacuum system, I got most of those out, but there will still be some. So um, what are we going to do about it? Because this design is no good and I can't move the radiator up. But even if I have now the cooling system completely free of air in this kind of a setup, then I'm still going to have a problem because whenever the engine is warming up, the cooling liquid will expand and that will cause a pressure. Now that is good to have a pressure in the cooling system and typically that's around 13 to 15 PSI because that allows the boiling point, point to be raised because you don't want to have uh, your cooling liquid to start boiling at around 100 degrees centigrade. So 
most cooling systems do have what we call a pressurized cooling system. But if the pressure is getting too high, it has to be relieved. And that is why radiators typically have a pressure release cap. And let me show you that. This is a pressure cap, and if I remove it, you'll see that at the inside, we actually have a spring and we got a seal. And this is actually the uh, valve that will open up whenever the pressure is sufficient uh, in size. And now the pressure on this cap is around uh, 13 PSI and I'll show it to you on how you can test that. So whenever that has been pushed open, because the pressure inside the cooling system has increased, then actually the cooling liquid will escape through a little hole on the side here into this uh, black hose and then it's going to either go to a um, spill tank or it's going to go on the ground. Uh, but of course on a racing car it should never go on the ground. It goes to actually a spill tank. So if this was a normal radiator sitting higher up than the engine, this wouldn't be a problem because we would have a little bit of air bubbles inside the radiator all the way on the top because over time uh, we would have been pushing out uh, when the engine was warm, cooling liquid, and then when the engine was uh, cooling down again, uh, that cooling liquid would shrink again, and then of course uh, we would have less cooling liquid, and therefore we would have a certain level of uh, air inside the radiator, and then it's just a matter of topping it up. It wouldn't affect actually the cooling of the engine as such, as long as it's not too much. But in this case, uh, this isn't going to work because the engine is sitting a lot higher up. So what I'm going to do now is to connect this black hose to an expansion tank which is higher up. And to do so, I have to eliminate the function of this cap. So I got a spare cap which is right here. And as you can see, I've been grinding off that um, seal there, so now cooling liquid can actually easily escape through the black hose to my expansion tank which is going to be higher up. So this is the fix. And this is the expansion tank that I'm going to use. It's about half a liter. That should be more than enough for this type of an engine. It's on OSP, really good quality and on the top we even have a um, pressure cap and we'll measure how much that is. I think this is going to be around 15 PSI. That should be good enough and if it's uh, too much you can always change it by adjusting a little bit the cap itself and then we should be good. So on the bottom I'm going to connect a hose which is going to the radiator and then on the top here we're going to connect the hose to the spill tank. This and that side here of course will blank off and we're going to install this higher up in the car. This right here is the old tank, uh, an overflow tank that was on this car. So this is something I am certainly going to remove because there's no more need for any of that. So let's get rid of this. And instead, I'm going to install this expansion tank right here. And you can see this is now more than high enough for the actual engine. So. Um, this is going to be working out just fine. So what I have right here is a pressure pump. So I can actually pump pressure into this connector here. And I can seal this off on this side with the actual cap I want to test. So let me put the cap from the uh, original radiator on. And then pump it up and see uh, what, what pressure I can retain. All right, so let's see when this guy is going to open up, right? You can see we're going up to about, well, I think it's around 13, 14, and then we lose the pressure. So this cap on the old radiator is around 13, 14 uh, PSI. So now let's uh, do the same test, but with the cap from PSI. And hopefully this is about the same. And... Um, if not, we will have to adjust things. All right. Okay, so let's pump it up and see. And this is 50. I need to weld up one of those connectors on the expansion tank because I don't have a stop for it. So, um, yeah, sometimes uh, you got to do things or do whatever you have. Huh?
So this is the bracket where we're going to put the uh, expansion tank on. This allows me to put the expansion tank a little bit higher up. Let's see. And this is where it's going to go, so that looks all right to me. So let me hook up some hoses and then we bolt it down. So the bottle fits just fine. All what's left to do now is put the cap up, the overflow and of course um, cooling liquid. And on the bottom I already have connected the blue hose, so now we need to connect it on the other side on the radiator. So I just connected up the other side of the blue hose to the radiator. So now I just need to tie it down and then we should be all good to go and we can fill it up and see what happens. I think these tie wraps, that's the best thing that was ever invented. So um, the next thing we need to take care of is the overflow of course of the expansion tank and this is over here. So I'm going to put a hose up and that clip, and this is not high pressure anyway, but ah, it still has to go on. All right, there we go. And then this is gonna go to my spill tank, and that's the next thing we have to install. Yeah, that's good. Uh, of course, I'm gonna fill it up first now with cooling liquid. Then we're going to start the engine, and then we'll work on the actual overflow tank. I had a bit of a choke. Let me check uh, the liquid. Check out. And I can see air bubbles coming in. Still feels cold though. But now I can see actually the cooling liquid rising. So I'm going to put the cap off. And this is actually the overflow which I already connected and there's already some water coming out of it. Not a lot, but I think once the engine is uh, even more warmed up, you'll see more coming out. Anyway, this will have to be connected to a spill tank. There you have it, 78 degrees centigrade. And also on our analog dial, we also have about uh, 78 degrees centigrade. So now that we have the cooling sorted out, we need to take care of the catch tank. So we've got cooling liquid, we've got fumes from the gas tank, and of course, and the carburetor. But we also got fumes from, or oil even, from the uh, oil pan. So therefore, we have a catch tank, and this is my catch tank. So I'm going to install it right here and uh, then we hook up the hoses and uh, yeah, we should be all good to go. Uh, this is nothing really special. I will have to make another bracket again and I'll probably do one along this side and then I can access it from the air intake here. Uh, so let me make that bracket and then uh, we bolt it together. Making a bracket is not that complicated. It's just a corner with a bolt going straight down and we fix it to the side here, done. So I have made this little aluminum bracket and now I just need to tighten it down and that's going to hold the spill tank. And here is the spill tank. Um, it's a very small one, but it will just do the job. It's a small engine, so uh, this is where it's going to go and I can take it off fairly easy. It actually has a breather as well, so I will have to uh, lock this down. But on the bottom, I'm gonna put some foam on so it doesn't rattle. All right. So let's see if this fits. Right, that's it. So let me connect it up and then we connect the hoses and we should be all set.
So as you have seen, there's a lot of small things that I had to do on this car uh, to get it a bit sorted out. All right. And now the next thing is to hook up all these hoses and um, that isn't all that difficult. I'll uh, make sure that I have sufficient slack on them. Oh, this is a bit too much, but um, let's cut it. second hose uh, which needs to come down in here uh, so that one will do probably with the leftovers that we have here because otherwise it's not gonna fit all right now these are not necessary with clamps because um, there is no pressure on and it's pretty tight already so uh, I'm not too much worried about it all the way in there and Velcroach is uh, always a pretty good uh, tool to keep things together you don't need to cut them afterwards the tie wraps or anything so that looks good so we've done quite a bit of work on this racing car and I know it was a little bit of different things but it all had to be done the radiator well we replaced that one we installed it we got all the hoses sorted out but also we fixed that design mistake and now we have a fixed cap actually on the head of the radiator. And part of fixing the cooling system was the installation of an expansion tank and that tank right now uh, is in a very easy place uh, so I have easy access to it and it holds about half a liter of cooling liquid. It also have an overflow and therefore we have installed a catch tank. And the catch tank is installed on the side of the uh, race car and we have easy access through the front. Uh, this is not a very big one, but it's containing about one liter of catching uh, liquid for both the cooling system and the uh, gas tank and also the oil pan. So we also installed a new battery together with some cabling and a starter relay. All that stuff was now put back on brackets and sorted out, besides the fact that we also installed a new fuel filter and did some other maintenance on the car, like new spark plugs, new oil filters and fresh oil. So now the engine is in a good condition, so uh, we should be able to start it up fairly easily, although the engine is cold, so let's give it a try. And that runs up very nicely. So folks, we have come to the end of this video and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I was actually uh, hoping as well that I could have installed the rear suspension and the drive shafts, uh, the new ones that we got uh, and the differential, but that will be for the next video because we can't do it all in one because it would make the video way too long. So I'll see you in my next video. And if you have any comments or any recommendations or anything else that you say, Steve, you got this totally wrong, please comment. Thank you for viewing and bye-bye.